Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. I'm Tammy Diedrich, the Managing Editor of IBM Systems Magazine Power Systems Edition, and I'm the moderator for this event. Today's webinar is sponsored by Xtool and is titled, How to Cut EDI Modernization Costs by Over 50%. Our featured speaker today is Jim O'Leary. Jim is the Vice President of Product Strategy at Xtool International and is an expert on strategic business and IT project planning. Jim has more than 20 years of senior and executive management experience with software companies, and he holds a deep understanding of current technological drivers across multiple industries. Today, Jim will share strategic options and best practices to greatly reduce the risk and cost typically associated with EDI modernization. Following the presentation, we will have a brief Q&A period, so please feel free to enter your questions in the question panel on your screen anytime during the presentation. Now, without further ado, thanks again for joining us today. And Jim, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Okay, thank you, Tammy. And welcome again, everyone, to today's webinar on EDI modernization and migration. Just a, a little bit of uh, setup here to explain where I'm going to focus uh, during today's discussion. Our previous webinars on this subject have focused primarily on the motivations for EDI modernization and on best practices for migrating from a legacy system to a modern one. But today, I'm going to be focusing on what is perhaps the, the biggest obstacle to EDI modernization, and that's concerns about the cost and risk of migration. Migration is a frequent source of questions from the businesses that we talk with about EDI modernization, and the most common view of migration is that it's a necessary evil, the price that one must pay in order to replace a functional solution with one that provides additional needed capabilities. But as I hope I'll convince you by the end of this webinar, migration can also be highly beneficial if you take advantage of the opportunities it presents. And if you take the right approach, you can also cut the cost of migration to a new EDI solution by over 50% when compared to the best options available just a few years ago. And at the same time, reduce the risk of errors and missed deadlines. So I have about 40 minutes of prepared material, and that should leave us plenty of time for your questions at the end. So again, as Sean mentioned, if you have a question or comment that you'd like to uh, like me to take up at the end of the presentation, please type it into the Q&A panel in the WebEx console. Okay, so let's start with a quick refresher on the main differences between classic EDI systems and the modern solutions that replace them. Let's start with uh, the differences in the scope of integration uh, capabilities. So classic EDI gives you the ability to integrate customers, vendors, and other external partners with your enterprise applications and data. We're all familiar with that model. Modern systems, on the other hand, are not limited to partner integration. They can also integrate internal and external applications with each other. They can integrate data. They can integrate services in any combination. Uh, classic EDI moves and transforms EDI and flat file documents, while modern EDI offers what's, uh, what's normally called any-to-any -any transformation and interchange in addition for XML documents, uh, database content, spreadsheets, and other kinds of, of data. Classic EDI is generally limited to implementing partner-facing inbound and outbound processes, whereas modern EDI offers general purpose end-to-end -end process automation capabilities. And classic EDI systems process data usually in batch mode, whereas modern EDI systems offer both batch and synchronous message at a time processing. Classic EDI solutions provide varying degrees of support for application integration and frequently depend on coding for last mile connections. Modern EDI, on the other hand, provides a largely code-free experience, although that varies from solution to solution using configurable adapters instead of code to connect with applications. And finally, classic EDI solutions are generally weak when it comes to activity visibility and auditability. Newer EDI solutions almost always include dashboards with extensive reporting, drill down, and alerting capabilities. So modern EDI systems reflect how EDI itself has changed uh, with support for new document types and more sophisticated process automation, and more productive user experiences, there are a lot of differences. At some point, nearly every business that's doing EDI runs it up against requirements that exceed the capabilities of their existing solution, and that's where the modernization process begins. Okay, so 
To set up our migration discussion, I want to cover uh, one more aspect of EDI modernization, and that is uh, to identify the main strategies for modernization. And the first one you see here is really to do nothing by processing manually what can't be automated. And of course, that's that's not really a modernization strategy, it's a coping strategy, but it's surprisingly widespread, so it's worth mentioning. Manual processing is, of course, costly and error prone, and it also places uh, severe limits on business volume. So this isn't a strategy that growing businesses should consider. Uh, the first real modernization strategy is to add point solutions as needed to meet new requirements. And examples of this include um, coding extensions to your um, uh, primary middleware solution, uh, using point tools or services for isolated requirements, and, uh, and there are others as well. But the main, uh, the main idea is simply to add capabilities, automated capabilities as needed. And the real benefit of this strategy is that it imposes low initial costs, but the disadvantages of point solutions generally outweigh those cost benefits. And some of those disadvantages are lack of integration with other EDI systems, um, multiple contacts for support purposes, siloed visibility, and additional overhead from multiple life cycle processes and skill sets and maintenance cycles. Ultimately, even if the initial costs are low, the long-term costs of uh, the point solution strategy really are higher than the other options. So the next option is to replace your legacy EDI solution with an outsourced service. And this is a viable option for uh, a large number of business, businesses, especially businesses with severely limited IT resources and skills. On the other hand, uh, businesses with high levels of partner churn and customization requirements are generally not good candidates for outsourcing. Um, we have, by the way, um, other webinars posted on the Excel website uh, that take up uh, these options in, in much more detail than I'm able to cover today. The last option is to replace legacy EDI infrastructure with a modern EDI system, uh, on-premise or through hosting. And this is the option we see the most, so most of what I'll be covering during the rest of this webinar will apply to this case. Now, the first two options, um, doing nothing and adding point solutions, are accretive in nature, so new capabilities are added to what's already in place. The second two are the cases where migration comes into play, whether you replace your legacy EDI system by outsourcing or replacing infrastructure, the first step in moving to a new solution is to somehow migrate your EDI assets to the new solution. So that's the backdrop for our migration discussion, and as I mentioned, there's a lot more to it, of course, than that. But um, I really want to zero in on the migration topic today. So the next thing I want to do is challenge the traditional view of migration as nothing but an unavoidable switching cost. So it starts with a look at the components of EDI costs. And EDI imposes four main kinds of costs. EDI software and service costs include software support and maintenance fees and service subscriptions and other recurring costs. Modernization isn't really targeted at this kind of cost, although some cost savings can occur in the form of consolidated license and maintenance fees if you're coming from a situation where you employed multiple point solutions in the past. Uh, the next category is onboarding costs, including the time and labor needed to create and maintain training partner integrations by provisioning communications, maps, uh, business processes, and other deliverables. Most modern EDI solutions offer substantial productivity and time savings benefits in this category. So this is one where moving to a modern EDI solutions can certainly lower your costs. The next category at the top actually is operating costs or operations costs, which include EDI monitoring and reporting, exception handling, system maintenance and backups, and other sort of daily or periodic functions. I'm also including avoidable manual processing in this bucket, for example, manually processing spreadsheet-based orders, uh, because those are things that, with the right solution, you could be automating. And the fourth component, taking this a bit out of sequence, is opportunity costs. This mostly refers to lost revenue opportunities due to missing capabilities or capacity, but it can also include lost cost-saving opportunities due to resource or budget misallocations. So except for opportunity costs, which are difficult to sort of calculate an average of, the cost curves that are shown here are characteristic of what we find in most businesses. 
Now, if you add all of these cost elements together, you end up with a total cost curve that looks something like this. Now let's add migration cost to the picture. And you can see the green dashed line on the left starts with a, a vertical section that might represent um, initial software license or fees or service assessment costs if you're outsourcing. And the slanted part of the line represents the effort to needed to recreate EDI assets in the new system. And we'll talk about how that works in a couple of minutes. As I mentioned earlier, it's a natural impulse to think about migration as an added cost. And here's what the total cost curve might look like if you simply added migration costs to the others that we see in the chart. And the red shaded area in the middle here represents the additional cost contributed by the migration effort. But looking at migration only from a cost perspective is a mistake because when the transition to the replacement solution occurs, then the benefits of a modern EDI system reduce overall cost. So let's take a look at that next. So, so this is really a more accurate depiction of total costs that includes cost savings brought on by the new solution. And you can see how the cost curve is bent downward at the point where migration is completed and transition to the new system occurs. And that occur, could occur over a period of time because migration doesn't have to occur in one fell swoop. But uh, anyway, the small circle arrow on the left indicates where that transition occurs and where the cost curve starts bending downward. And once the new, new solution's in place, the curves cross and then the cost of migration ultimately is paid back. And uh, at some point you achieve return on your investment. Now, ROI depends on many factors uh, and that includes things like the number of trading partners that you have, uh, the amount of partner volatility and change frequency you experience, the transaction mix that you need to support. And as we'll see in a minute, the approach that you take to migration is also a big factor in ROI. But it's clear from this chart that the sooner you transition to the modern EDI replacement solution, the better your ROI becomes. So to better illustrate that point, let's see what would happen if we could cut our migration costs in half without adding resources. So here's the result. Um, here's what it looks like by having the length of the migration cost line, the point at which the total cost curve bends moves to the left. And you can see two main consequences of that uh, change. First of all, the cost of migration itself is halved. And this isn't as obvious as it could be because the total cost curve here includes costs unrelated to migration, mainly EDI license and service costs. But the second impact is obvious, and that is that the cost curves cross sooner than they did before. So the cost benefits of the modern EDI replacement solution accrue faster. Now, cost savings aren't usually the main motivation for replacing an EDI system. More often, uh, decisions are driven by the need for new capabilities. But cost is an important consideration, of course, and the role that rapid migration plays in hastening new benefits is not as well appreciated as, as it should be. And we'll talk about other benefits that rapid migration offers in just a couple of minutes. But first, let's take a step back and look at the main EDI investment areas that migration has an impact on. There are really three main investment areas uh, that EDI migration impacts. Replacing integration infrastructure is the first area, and that is what provides new capabilities, which could include uh, support for new document syntaxes, more powerful process automation capabilities, and better performance and throughput. And this impact is determined at the point, of course, where you choose your modern EDI replacement solution. That's what determines the um, integration infrastructure uh, impact. The second investment impact is on EDI configurations, including trading partner connections, maps, application and data interfaces, and other assets that you or your service provider create. This is the primary focus of the discussion uh, going forward, so I'll be focusing on how migration impacts EDI configurations most for the rest of the webinar. And the third investment area is uh, skills and best practices. Moving to a new EDI solution entails learning new ways to onboard trading partners, uh, managing daily processing, monitoring uh, activities and outcomes, and maintaining the system, and so on. Although this is really a very critically important area, most of the changes needed to accommodate the new solution are worked out as a byproduct of the migration process. So in other words, 
if you focus on the EDI configuration part of migration, uh, the skills and best practices part of the migration effort sort of take care of themselves. So again, we'll focus primarily on that middle section of uh, impact from this point on. Before we go there, let's answer one question that might be uh, the elephant in the room at this point, and that is why can't we just convert our legacy EDI configurations to corresponding assets in the new target system? So we've invested a lot of time and effort to provision trading partners in our current system. Can't we somehow reuse those investments? Well, the answer is no for a number of reasons, and some of those reasons are actually beneficial. So the first is that Conversion doesn't work even for objects with similar functions in the two systems, like uh, maps and interfaces, for example. And the reason for that is that the semantics and representations of those objects differ greatly between EDI solutions. So it's not an easy matter to take a, a map, for example, that you've uh, built in a, a legacy system and convert that to a map in a new system. There might also be platform dependencies, and this, this one doesn't come up all the time, but if your legacy system took advantage of platform capabilities, then again, uh, there's no easy way to convert some of those uh, dependencies in the new system. The third reason is intellectual property infringement. There are actual court cases that have come up, have arisen because of vendors um, actually referencing not just objects, but even reports and other representations of objects. And so there's a, a lot of uh, intricate case law that uh, dissuades um, any, whether it's you or a vendor doing the work, uh, taking objects from an existing system and converting them to a new system. Now, there are a couple of things that are actually beneficial reasons for, for not going through conversion. The first is solution-specific best practices. Every solution has um, a better, better and worse ways of being used and exploited. And um, unless you build your EDI configurations in a way that exploits best practices for the system you're using, you're probably going to end up with suboptimal performance or capabilities. So it's really important that you design EDI configurations for the system that you're going to be deploying them on. And that might not be the case uh, with your legacy assets. Then secondly, uh, there's technical debt. Um, and this is, uh, for example, all of the things that you've done to change your system over a period of years that you'd rather not carry forward into the new system. So one of the benefits of migration is that it really forces you to start with a clean sheet and uh, eliminate all that technical, technical debt. Okay, so let's get back to migration here and um, look at, again, sort of where the payoff is, um, not just in terms of the uh, areas that um, I just covered, but some additional ones. This, this is a very simple diagram representing the traditional view of migration, and as I mentioned, that, that migration is mainly a cost that you need to get past in order to realize the benefits of a modern EDI solution. The main benefit of moving to a new solution is that migration produces new EDI configurations, new assets like business processes and maps, for example, that can greatly reduce the time and cost of onboarding new partners, particularly if you reuse them. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, and at the same time, improve maintainability and other aspects of your system as well. And I mentioned some other migration benefits a, a minute ago. Migration provides an opportunity to retire patches and workarounds and other technical debt. Um, it's an opportunity to discover and adopt and instill new best practices for the replacement system. And the incorporation of best practices in new onboarding assets, uh, new EDI configurations, can reduce testing effort and exceptions and lead also to better overall system reliability. So. These benefits are very difficult to quantify, especially in advance, but I, I do want to sort of um, suggest the best practice here, which is you really should measure them uh, once you gain experience with your new EDI system uh, for several reasons. One is to make sure that you, uh, you're realizing the benefits that you expected to get from your new system, and if your metrics tell you that you're not, then uh, you might want to take a look at, at some of the areas that you've been measuring. And secondly, um, it's a way to sort of measure progress uh, over time. Without metrics, it's difficult to tell whether you're doing things better or worse than, than before. Now, none of these benefits occur automatically, and how you decide to migrate 
determines not only how long it will take, but also how efficient your use of the replacement solution is once migration is complete. And the three most important factors in determining the efficiency of your migration strategy are first uh, defining templates for the integration use cases that you need to support based on an analysis of current and future integration patterns. So one of the first things you do in a migration uh, process is take, try to sort of discern patterns from all of the partner integration cases that you have or expect to have, and then um, based on an analysis of commonalities, build templates so that you uh, can solve the problem once instead of uh, multiple times. The second factor is the level at which you apply the templates to create new projects, integrations, and objects from existing ones. And I'll get into that in detail in just a minute, but it turns out that this is a major influence on the amount of time it takes you to migrate to the new solution and also to on new, onboard new partners afterward. And the third factor uh, is how effectively you employ automation to save time and reduce our errors. This is something, again, uh, I, I think is one of the most underappreciated aspects of migration, which is that uh, it's not just a cost, it's really a huge opportunity. To, um, to make your EDI experience and investment more effective. Let's move on and talk a little, at a little deeper level about, um, about what we're actually migrating and, or what we're actually recreating in the, in the target system. And um, one of the main differences between legacy EDI systems and modern EDI systems is that Modern EDI systems are much more focused on the, uh, on the ability to reuse. So generally, EDI uh, configurations are represented, are implemented as uh, systems of objects, objects like maps or business processes or adapters that reference each other and interact in order to produce an outcome like processing an inbound set of purchase orders or sending uh, invoices to a customer. So um, what we see here is a representation of, the, um, uh, of a project repository that contains various levels of, uh, of objects and object collections. Uh, the bottommost level is individual objects, as I, as I mentioned, like maps, business processes, adapters. Uh, they get collected typically in integrations. Um, integrations are, uh, let's define integrations here. Integrations are systems of one or more business processes that work together to achieve a business outcome. So as I mentioned before, um, a collection of objects that implements an inbound purchase order process is an example of an integration. And integrations do things like validate and transform data and uh, then perhaps update one or more uh, application systems or even external systems for that matter. Now, um, templates are reusable objects or collection of objects that support reuse at different levels. So we can have templates for objects. For example, we could have an adapter template. We could have templates for integrations. Again, we could have a, a template for um, sending out bound invoices. Or we could even have templates at the project level. A project might be, uh, as we can see here in this example, um, a set of integrations that implements an order to invoice um, set of processes. So in this case, the template includes an integration for inbound sales orders, one for inbound order changes, one for outbound shipment notices, and another for outbound invoices. There are, of course, acknowledgments in there as well for the inbound uh, uh, transactions. So uh, templates can support reuse at all of those levels. Productivity and cost reduction and reliability ben benefits, what, which I'll, I'll try to itemize in more detail later, uh, vary according to the level at which reuse is applied. So again, as I mentioned before, when, when I talked about the three factors that mostly affect migration speed and, and efficiency, the level at which you apply reuse is possibly the most important decision that you make in terms of uh, uh, achieving efficient migration. Now let's talk about those different levels of reuse. So the lowest level of reuse is the object level. So here we see an example of reusing an adapter, in this case an FTP adapter, so we, um, we reference an FTP adapter that was created for an earlier project, and we simply um, change the URL and perhaps some of the um, FTP dialog uh, uh, parameters and 
create a new instance based on the old FTP adapter. So what were the, the benefits that we achieve at this level of reuse are uh, standardization. So for example, um, although it's the, the adapter example isn't the best here, but let's say you're reusing a business process, you might have incorporated a standard error uh, notification step in your business process. And, and you, you always want to notify um, users of, of process errors, whether they're transformation errors or communication errors or whatever, you have a standard way of doing that notification. So that's the best practice that you want to standardize, standardize across all of your business processes. So by reusing business process objects, you can achieve that kind of standardization. Reuse also reduces maintenance costs because um, you're, you're uh, not recreating the entire object in, in all cases, and it reduces risk because some of the more complicated aspects of configuration can be done once instead of many times. But reuse at the individual object level really offers modest productivity benefits. So let's go up a level and talk about reuse at the integration level. And again, integrations are systems of one or more um, business processes that work together to achieve some business outcome. And you can design integrations for reuse by parameterizing uh, routing and business process objects. For example, to make an integration reusable for multiple trading partners, you could conf configure um, in input data location, uh, sender ID, map name, things like that as parameters that are resolved at runtime. Because this strategy reuses systems of objects at a time, it is a more efficient way to create new integrations than object level reuse. But an equally important advantage is that integration templates incorporate best practices and tested object configurations that reduce testing time and improve overall reliability. Okay, moving forward, um, the highest level of reuse uh, is the project level. And the reason it's the highest level is that projects contain, can contain any number of integrations and objects. So you can define a project really any way you, you wish. Uh, a common way, however, to organize projects is what we saw earlier, including all of the integrations needed to provision a particular trading partner. Now, uh, and this shows, uh, and I'll, I'll get to the details of this in a second, but the basic idea here is to take a project template and use it as input to a project generation process that produces a new project that can be cu customized, tested, and ultimately deployed. Now, you can see that this box is labeled project generator, not project generation process. And the reason for that is, uh, is twofold. First of all, as the level of reuse rises, the number of customizations and the likelihood of committing errors as you customize increases. So, you might have a project with uh, literally hundreds of objects in it. That would be a large project, but it's possible. And configuring every object individually in that project to produce a new project based on it um, is a pretty uh, manually time-consuming and error-prone error process. So that's, that's the first challenge, or, or that is the, the main challenge with this, this level of reuse. The answer to that challenge is to employ automation. So it turns out, and this is based on a fairly granular analysis of the methodology that we use in our own consulting engagements, that over half of reuse-related activity is predictable and automatable. So examples are uh, establishing the new projects in the first place, renaming objects, perhaps with partner-specific conventions, um, setting partner-specific parameters, configuring acknowledgments and routing. There are a number of things that, are, that can sort of be mechanically customized. Mapping is not one of them. Mapping is something that generally requires a human being to make decisions, but many, many other aspects of customiz customizing a project can be automated. And because of that, migration at this level, at the project level, is the most productive and efficient way to migrate to a new solution. Now, let's quantify that uh, a bit. Here's a, a diagram of cost savings, migration cost savings for the three reuse strategies I just mentioned. Now, the, uh, on the baseline for this comparison really is object level reuse. Nobody is going to avoid reuse <laughs> if they can take advantage of it. So the, the no reuse case really isn't uh, realistic. 
But as an approximation, if you did have, if you did recreate every single object and every single integration in your new system manually, or using the tools available in your new solution, you would spend about 75% more time uh, than if you engaged in object level reuse. Okay, so you get uh, an immediate benefit by reusing at any level. Uh, the next level up is integration level reuse, and, and the way this works is basically you create, I mentioned before the idea of um, analyzing integration patterns and coming up with a limited set of integrations that you need that you can that you can reuse and customize to accommodate all of your different trading partner uh, cases. So uh, if you build integrations that um, and maps that accommodate those cases and then reuse those integrations, you can achieve uh, about 3.5% more productivity. Now, why isn't it higher than this? Uh, the answer is, first of all, it takes a little bit of time to create those reusable integrations. Um, that's not the main reason, though. Uh, it just turns out that object level reuse, uh, most object lo level reuse takes advantage of object collection reuse anyway. So the main benefit, really, of integration level reuse is incorporation of best practices, reducing maintenance, reducing risk, the things that we talked about earlier. Now, the big surprise is that automated project level reuse is almost 60% higher uh, in terms of cost savings than basic object level reuse. Now, why would that be? It's not because you're doing anything different in terms of the, the objects that you're reusing. You're always reusing objects at the lowest level somehow and at the integration level somehow. The reason for this is because of automation. I mentioned that over half of reuse activities can be automated mechanically. And if you do automate them mechanically, it turns out that you achieve that over 50% benefit. Now, it, just as a note, this, uh, these numbers are derived from a case where you're migrating 100 EDI partners with uh, an average of three common EDI transaction types. If you have larger numbers of partners, generally speaking, the, um, the benefit goes up a bit, sort of hovers around 60%. Uh, but if you have a larger number of transactions, then the benefit goes down a bit. But generally speaking, you're going to get over 50% improvement simply by reusing at the project level and automating as much reuse as possible. Okay, now there's one more bit to the story, and that is the case where you need to, uh, need to um, migrate or onboard multiple trading partners at once. So here's how that works. Now, if you... If you migrate or onboard a single trading partner using a, a, a project template, essentially the process is one where you supply a set of parameters that, that characterize uh, that particular trading partner. So it might be a uh, trading partner ID, it would be um, uh, the, 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 well, the locations uh, where in, input data can be found, where output data is put, that kind of stuff. Uh, but if you collect that information in the form of either a partner profile table or simply supply enveloped EDI data, much of that same process can be automated with almost no human input. So in this particular case, let's say we provided a set of interchanges for multiple partners uh, as input to the project generator. It can produce, with that information, with that input, projects for multiple partners in one step that can then individually be customized, tested, and deployed. So uh, you can take this idea of project level generation and customization and migration and onboarding to uh, the level where if you have a number of partners that you need to migrate or onboard at the same time, uh, the process can move very swiftly. So just in terms of wrapping up, uh, let me just address the, the question of when the right time is to modernize. So we've talked about why migration makes sense and, and, and the fact that it produces benefits and how to cut migration time. Um, and there are really two kinds of factors that generally influence when modernization occurs. The first set of factors are what are called disruptive factors. So these are significant changes like uh, an ownership change in your company, uh, merger and acquisition, activity, new major customers uh, surfacing with new requirements that you can't accommodate with your existing solution. It could be that you're migrating from 
uh, one platform to a new platform and you need to change your EDI system because it only ran on the old platform, uh, could be application, major application upgrades that give you an opportunity to uh, modernize EDI at the same time. So there are a number of these large changes that generally um, trigger the decision to replace EDI. But it's really important to recognize that there are also cumulative factors, things that build up, problems that build up over a period of time that are equally, if not perhaps more important to consider uh, when you make a modernization decision. Things like customer service or performance issues. If, there, if there's a track record of problems with a particular customer and um, you can trace it to the inability to, let's say, provide the visibility that you need to answer customer questions, that's a solution uh, problem, not, not a people problem. Uh, could be lost revenue, lost business because of missing capabilities, or um, manual processing costs. So there's an interesting study done by uh, Supply Chain Strategies uh, a little over a year ago that uh, has some sort of eye-opening statistics about how much the typical company spends in, in manually processing transactions. That's a something that very few companies really take a close look at uh, and can be a reason by itself to modernize. So anyway, these cumulative factors are, uh, as I mentioned, equally important. And um, so the, the answer to the question of when the right time to modernize is if, there, if one of the disruptive factors occurs or if there's a sufficient level of pain in one, one or more of these cumulative factor areas that you can use as a justification for moving to a modern solution. Okay, let me wrap up with just a few um, suggested best practices or success factors for EDI modernization. Uh, and the first one, we didn't really cover this in this presentation, but the first thing to do is to perform a thorough gap analysis uh, between your, your existing system and what you need in your new system. And in that gap analysis, of course, you need to consider not just current requirements, uh, and perhaps capabilities that cost you to lo lose business in the past, missing capabilities, but also things that you can anticipate as future needs. So that's sort of step one. Secondly, we talked about cost earlier, and the key to the cost analysis is to include not just all cost factors, but also offsetting savings that you'll achieve by moving to a new solution. That could include faster onboarding, less time and, and cost uh, spent on onboarding, uh, hands-free processing, uh, getting rid of some of those manual processes, and the ability to give business users uh, uh, visibility and uh, problem resolution capabilities. Third is, uh, of course, as I just mentioned, exploit disruptive factors to drive a modernization decision. If there's something significant that's occurring or about to occur in your business, that's a good opportunity to sort of take stock of your EDI situation and if appropriate, uh, make the argument for moving to a better solution. And again, um, don't ignore those cumulative factors. They, they're generally, these are the sort of the straw that broke the camel's back uh, factors. They're not things that might um, convince you um, to move to a new solution uh, if you look at them individually, but as a whole, there might be plenty of reason uh, to move to a new solution um, just in order to get rid of manual processes, visibility problems, customer service problems, and so on. And then finally, where it's appropriate, it's also a good idea to um, in, involve your vendor, uh, whoever your, your vendor of choice is for your new solution, uh, in discovering best practices and incorporating those best practices in the EDI assets that you deploy in your new system. So that's it, uh, we have about uh, a little more, about 10 minutes for questions. Um, here's a question about outsourcing. Uh, your migration discussion seemed to focus on keeping EDI in-house. Can you comment on the pros and cons of outsourcing? Yeah, it's, um, as I mentioned, the, the, the outsourcing, first of all, is the right solution approach for a significant number of companies. And the reasons can be as basic as that the, the fact that you don't have the resources to do EDI on your own. Um, we find that commonly with um, uh, not, not just smaller companies, but fast growing companies uh, who have limited IT resources to spend and, and uh, don't want to focus uh, the attention of their um, 
uh, IT staff on EDI. They'd rather focus uh, their staff on sort of differentiating application capabilities. So those are cases where outsourcing makes sense. I, as I mentioned before, though, whether you're re replacing uh, an on-premise EDI solution, or it could be a hosted solution, doing EDI yourself, or you decide to outsource EDI, in both cases, you need to consider migration because there will be a migration uh, process whether you outsource or don't outsource. Okay, um, what about internal and external application and data integration? Where does that fit in the migration picture? Yeah, um, okay, so we've been talking about replacing classic EDI or legacy EDI systems, which generally don't do data and application integration. Um, and by that, I mean that they perhaps do data and application integration as part of an EDI integration process, but they don't do application to application integration, for example, or data to data integration. So, uh, but there might be cases where uh, perhaps there are point solutions. You have uh, not just a legacy EDI system, but also uh, additional solutions to do application integration or web service integration or data integration. And there is an opportunity there, depending on the um, EDI replacement solution that you choose, to replace not just the EDI system, but also um, application and data integration uh, solutions. So why would you want to do that? Um, well, first of all, you might want to simply consolidate what are a number of, you know, multiple software licenses. Um, you might have a case where the your um, application integration solution vendor provides good support, but your EDI solution vendor doesn't provide good support. So you want to um, move to a vendor who provides good support for all the kinds of integration you do. Um, you might want to have visibility across the multiple categories of integration that you do, so that you have one place to go to track activity, not just for EDI integration, but for other kinds of integration as well. So it does potentially fit into the migration picture, uh, but it's really a matter of sort of what the scope is uh, for your replacement decision. Okay, let's see. Uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a question about migrating non-EDI document integration cases. So what are the differences in migrating and onboarding trading partners who use non-EDI documents versus standard EDI documents? Um, in, in Well, in theory, there's not much difference. Um, the, the first question is whether the solution that you choose, the replacement solution you choose, supports uh, the non-EDI cases that you, need, that you need to migrate, and I'm assuming that is the case here. Um, there are differences, of course, between non-EDI and EDI cases. EDI data is enveloped, and the, the envelope contents uh, provide routing and other information that's useful in processing EDI documents. Typically, you don't get that kind of information with non-EDI cases, flat files, spreadsheets, most XML documents don't provide that, that kind of uh, capability. So it's you can't really apply the same integration model to those non-EDI cases, but you can migrate them. Um, you simply go through similar steps, you analyze the integration patterns involved, you create templates for those customers if they uh, if they occur multiple times. If not, they could be uh, one-off integrations that you need to build. Um, that's probably the biggest difference is that um, EDI follows a pattern that generally reproduces itself across training partners, whereas um, flat file integration, for example, could be very specific to a particular partner or spreadsheet integration. Um, so that's probably the biggest difference is that you might not get the same level of reuse for non-EDI cases, but you can use the same tools and methods to create um, the templates and make them as maintainable and reusable as you need them to be. Okay, um, let's take one more question here. Are retail partners forces to support a large variety of transaction types and versions? Um, how much does that increase migration effort, especially for mapping? I sort of just answered that uh, because if, if um, well, if it's, a, if it's a large variety of EDI transaction types and versions, I guess that's a different case. So let's, let's take that assumption. Um, if you have 
uh, a wide variety of EDI transaction types and, uh, and versions across your trading partner community. It does affect, for example, um, the standards document definitions that you incorporate and use in mapping. Uh, those things differ between, between partners, so uh, your mapping also differs. So really what it means is that um, you can still achieve pretty much the same level of reuse at the level of adapters and business processes, but perhaps not quite the same level of re reuse at, um, at the level of mapping. So the main impact that I can see there is that um, if you have a larger variety of transaction types and versions, EDI transaction types and versions, you're going to spend a little bit more time in mapping uh, when you go through the migration. Okay, um, that's it for my part of the webinar. Uh, Tammy, I will turn it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Jim, for sharing your expertise with us today. So that concludes our webinar. I want to thank everyone for attending and have a great day.